Tonight we're going to talk about hydroponics and growing vegetables in your house in the winter. And we'll talk both hydroponically and in soil. So that sometimes when you garden all summer or you buy at the farmer's market, then all of a sudden in winter, you're kind of in a food desert. You don't have that fresh vegetables that you had all summer long. And so we're going to talk about how you can have those. And did everybody get the little handouts? Okay, cool. Because it's like intermittently working. Should I turn it off? Is it okay with it? Can you hear? Okay, just a minute. Let me turn it off. Can you hear me anyway? Okay. Good enough? Okay. Okay. We'll turn this one off. And maybe it's because I have two mics on there. So what is hydroponics? And before I ask that question, does anybody in here have hydroponics? Oh, good. So you guys just come up and teach this class. I'm not doing it. <laughs> but hydroponics is really basically growing plants in a substrate, water, or sometimes it's in like perlite, vermiculite, um, um, clay pellets and the water just goes through it. It's not in soil. And so it's different, um, but in some ways much better. So the, here's just a few different types of hydroponics that you can have actually in your house. Um, the nice thing about hydroponics, I can grow 365 days a year. It doesn't matter if it's 40 below, it doesn't matter if it's 100 degrees outside. It, the system just works as long as I want it to do. Now there are some pros and cons. One of the best pros that I've ever found with hydroponics is that they grow so fast, up to 50% faster than they would if you planted that seed in the soil. And so that's always a benefit to me. Um, you have a greater control um, on your production. I always grow basil as one of my components in my hydroponic system because it'll literally be two feet tall and I just cut it all the way down and it grows again and I cut it again and so um, growing herbs, vegetables are a great thing in a hydroponic system. Um, Soil-borne pathogens or nematodes, funguses, you don't have that because you're in a hydroponics and so it doesn't get introduced through any soil. Um, greater yield depending on the vegetable that you're growing. Um, a lot of people will say that hydroponics is always a greater yield, but I have found that when I grow squash or cucumbers, though I get them, I don't get them as I do in the summertime. And so it just depends on the vegetable that you're using. But you do use a lot less water. Now, drawbacks. If your power goes out, most of the hydroponic systems are just sitting there. Now, some hydroponic systems don't have much movement anyway, so losing power for two days wouldn't be a real big deal. But tower ones, things that really need that exchange every, well, mine I have it set at every 15 minutes. Some of them are every 20 or 30 minutes. So if your power went out, that is a drawback. Um, there's always a cost involved. Some things are very cheap, and we're going to talk about some of those. Some of them are very expensive. So it just depends on what you do, what your goals are, on how you want your hydroponics to work. Um, you can, it can require management. Where in your garden sometimes, all you gotta do is water and you can pull the weeds next week. <laughs> but in a hydroponic system, there are things to do. Now there is one other con and I wondered if anybody else knows a con on hydro, a hydroponic system. The biggest other con to me is that certain things need pollination. If I'm growing cucumbers in my hydroponics, I have to hand pollinate them. Um, a tomato, I just have to vibrate that flower. Or the pepper, I just vibrate the flower. But there are things that I use a Q-tip to pollinate. So it just depends on what you're growing. If you're just growing herbs and lettuce, you never want the seeds, it doesn't make any difference. But if you wanted fruit, you just have to know that sometimes you have to 
pollinate. Now, there are four or five different kinds of systems. And so we're just going to kind of do an overview. Um, a wick system actually uses something that is like a thick um, candle wick, and it moves the water into the substrate. Um, which could be like perlite, vermiculite that the roots are growing into. Um, the, the only problem I ever see with that is that certain plants don't want the roots wet all the time. Otherwise, it's not a bad system. It's very cheap um, and easy to do. Now, a floating raft, I have a couple pictures. This is just a tub. You're putting holes in there. You're using little net cups. These are net cups that the, the plant actually goes into. And depending on the size hole you do, you have different size net cups. Um, I have done these lots of times. Um, you float styrofoam, and each little plant is in its own thing. So I showed, this is what it looks like from top, but this is what it looks like from the side. So the net cups are coming down, your plant is in there, the roots come into the nutrient solution, and you have an air bubbler. Um, some people just use the little stone. Some have, depending on the size, have a much more forcible water movement. But they are easy, they're cheap, and you can just set them in different parts of your yard. Um, I, one time at the community garden, must have been two years ago maybe, <coughs> I had a stock tank. And so I just floated them on there and because I'm in the community garden, there is no electricity for me to use. So every day I would take the hose and I would just spray water hard into it, knowing that I'd have to add more nutrients if I added too much water. But I just wanted the oxygen to go in there. And so it works okay. There are ways to do it without electricity. But if you have a, a source of electricity, it makes it much easier for you. Now the next two ones, our oven flow system. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you what that looks like. Like this is one that it's coming up, it has sections. Sometimes an oven flow can actually even be in a tub, but it's up above and the plants sit in a tube usually. There's, um, there's a lot of them that do that. Um, it usually floods that tube or that um, basket for about 20 to 30 minutes and then it drains it away and it just cycles it through. Now hydroponics is different than aquaponics because aquaponics has fish involved and so the nutrients from the fish are filtering through but sometimes the systems are very similar looking. Um, the NT NFT is a system like the ebb and flow only it's usually upward now the one that I have that I'm going to show you pictures, mine doesn't actually have tubes that you have the plants in. Mine is a whole wall unit. And so it just depends on what you want to do. Each one has pros and cons. And in some of your paperwork, it talks about the different ones. Now growing mediums. What are you going to put your seed in to grow in your hydroponics? Like my hydroponics that's along my wall fits these little net cups. And you can get, um, oh, some of them are called rapid rooters, um, and they look like actual soil. I never use those because they get the water dirty and I don't like it. So what I use <coughs> is rock wool. And this is spun rock, and it has a little hole in it, and the seed goes right in there and it doesn't fall apart. I'll send it around, you guys can feel it. It's, they're weird. Um, and what is it called, rock wool? Rock wool. Okay. And um, it's very stable. It's easy to put your seed in there. And I usually put two seeds in, in case one of them doesn't germinate. Um, but it actually, see, they, they heat it to 1,500 degrees Celsius. And they spin it, which is, I always told my husband, who's sitting around thinking, hmm, if I heat that up, that rock up enough, it's going to just be like cotton candy. <laughs> but 
it works and the roots will just go through it and it will just work wonderfully. And then at the end of the season, when that plant is done, I just toss that out. Do you reuse it? I don't reuse those. You probably could cut all the roots off and pull that all out. You probably could, but they're real cheap. They come in flats of, oh, there must be, they're three across. They're, you order them online. Amazon has it. So is this something you could just like throw in your compost pile or not? I, I don't think it would ever biodegrade though. Yeah. If you needed some air space, you could break it up and put it in a compost pile though. Would rain birds have They, I would guess they probably do because they have a lot of hydroponic stuff down there. And they're probably the only place in town that you can get hydroponics. But as we go through, they have a lot of the products that you can use for hydroponics. Which store? Um, rain gardens. They're down over by um, Menards and yeah, yeah. They have the greenhouses. They're in the trees, and they have an actual storefront too. It's extremely fun to go to. <laughs> it is. Or when it's pouring rain, and oh yeah, I like rain gardens. Um, they are slightly alkaline. But I've never seen it affect any plant at all that I've used. These are not the Yeah, slightly. Yeah. Um, now you can use expandable clay pellets. Most of the time when people are using net cups that are like this size or this size, that's what they're using. And the roots will just go through it. They just look like little clay balls that are about this big. And I'll show you a picture as we go. Um, they are more spendy, but they are you just reuse them and reuse them and reuse them. They're never, you know, it's just an investment in your hydroponics. Um, some people will use perlite or vermiculite. That does not work on some systems. It, it's usually when you have a basket and the water is just gently going through. If these, are, these holes are too big, um, it'll go down into your system. And so, though, Perlite and vermiculite do work. It just has to have the right system. Now, this is my system that I have. Um, it has six across. There's um, five high. Down below here um, is the water um, reservoir. And so I just take these little net cups. These little blue pieces of tape are just me telling me what I'm planting. Like, um, it, it'll say what I am, three, and then I'll know that I planted three of those. Um, it's just an easy way for me to keep track. But it, when it first starts out of that rock wool that you guys have, it just starts to come up right here. When the tomato or pepper or different vegetables come up, then I wrap this around it. See how it expands? And it's a collar, really. It does a couple things. One, it gets less light into my hydroponic system. If you get a lot of light inside your hydroponic system, you will get algae. It, it's, it doesn't hurt anything. It's just green inside there. And you have to scrub it off. Um, but it also, because it's thicker, it kind of supports that plant when it's first growing. And I'll pass it around. It's just foam stuff. Some people will cut skinny um, swimming noodles, and they'll use that. And they come in different colors or black, whatever you'd like. But you have to wait till your seedling is up. Yes, I wait till my seedling is up, and then I put the collar around it. Because sometimes it'll come in crooked and stuff like that. Now, this is my same hydroponic system um, about a month and a half, two months later. And so um, you can see how tall, because the hydroponics ends about right here, and the plants grow way above it. But because it has that wave metal, this part right here, it kind of supports the plant so they don't just droop over. And that's just one of the benefits of mine. There's lots of different ones. Um, I grow a lot of tomatoes. Um, there's tomatoes that are made for like arrow gardens, um, a system like this that are, they're dwarf, 
um, some people call them micro tomatoes. And so they'll get, some of them are full size, but I usually just grow the cherries because then I just eat them when I'm doing stuff. <laughs> they never come to the kitchen. But it's very lush because you're using a nutrient system, you know, nutrients in there. Um, here's some other ones. There are huge factories in different countries that have just rows and rows of hydroponics. And they, they grow them and sell them at the stores. Um, I like these ones. They look very futuristic, I guess. They just, I just like what they look like. Um, and the shape obviously has some benefits. And a lot of those rotate around with the, you know, so that it's always getting lights and movement. And so that's kind of fun. But you do have to have nutrients in a hydroponic system. Now this is what I usually use. Um, once you start getting the growth of your plants and the roots are coming down inside the hydroponics, it uses a lot of water. So every time I have to add water to it, I'm adding nutrients. Um, and when the plants are big, I'm adding water basically every week because there's just so much. Jody? Because you said water, do you like you start out with like reverse osmosis water or the tap water? I just use the tap water. Okay. I know there are people that um, do hydroponics and they, um, they want their water pure. They want, well, I'm not gonna do that, you know? I don't have time to do that. I don't have a reverse osmosis. And I water my plants outside with my hose. And so I figured if they can live out there, they certainly can live inside with it. Mm -hmm. And so it's just choices that people make. It's not right or wrong either way. It's just choices. Chlorine is one of your nutrients. There's chlorine in the water. Yeah, there is chlorine in the water. Yeah. Um, but I like this. It helps it have be very lush. Um, there are things that you can add when it blooms. I just use this all the time. I never change. What's it? It's called Maxi Grow. You get that on mm -hmm. Amazon also. You can get it on Amazon, yes. Where did you mm -hmm. get it? Well, um, did you order it? when I first got my system, I ordered lots of bags of this because the, the company that I bought it from, can they sell it, but you can get it on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. And so what you're looking for, you have to have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, normal things that every garden has. Um, then you want the secondary ones, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And then the nutrients, which are all combined into that, um, magnesium, boron, copper, all of those micronutrients that we add to our gardens. So you're basically just gardening in water. So um, I just kind of look, like, look at it that, and I don't even really think anymore that, oh, this is water, this is, you know, soil, because there's just things that you do, and it just becomes part of your every time routine. So this system is my daughter's system. She has um, two eye harvests, that's what these are called, they're called eye harvests. And she just bought this tent, and so she had cleaned everything out, and she's moving in, and this is a grow tent. It must be eight feet long and probably six feet wide, and it's as tall as seven feet tall. It has its own filter system in there. It has its own lights. It moves air. It circulates. So she's showing a picture of it, but these doors actually close up. And so it just looks like a tent in your room that you're using. But um, these are the reservoirs that keep the water. And then there's a hose that goes up the center. And this little reservoir up here has holes and it just percolates down where the plants are. This is a bucket system, a five gallon bucket system. And she is using these to grow her plants in. Now, she has those little clay pellets. It has a, a bubbler in there. It moves the water. And so this, these are two avocados, and then the peppers are in the back. 
But a pepper will live five years. So it's not like it's like in your garden. When it's in the season, you're done. But in a hydroponic system and in a tent system, she can have that grow for five, six years. And the plant gets huge. Now that this is like regular green peppers? Or? Regular green peppers, yep. What about like jalapenos you, it, or habaneros? Yep, any of those would work. Any of the peppers yeah. have a long life? They do. Um, they're only annuals because we're in Wyoming. If you lived in Mexico, <laughs> they, they grow all the time. They can make great big bushes. And so like when you're down south, you see those braided and with all the red peppers going down. They probably came from one plant. And so, what, you know, there's a lot of things that would grow year-round that don't grow year-round in Wyoming. Right. Yeah. Sandy, yes. Is that, was that two tents or one tent? It's one tent. Okay. Yeah, it just has two doors that open up and, and then she can regulate how much airflow there is in there. And um, then you don't have that glaring light depending on where you have that set. Like if you had it in your basement, it, it gets really warm inside there because the doors are closed, has a lot of humidity, and the plants just go crazy in there. Does she have to run a fan at all? It has one in, it's okay. built in there. Nice. Yeah, so she can regulate. So if it starts to get too warm, it will run more. It, it's really a nice automated s system. <coughs> and where do you get something like that? <laughs> um, I know she ordered it online. I could get, Ruth, I could get the, the name of it. Yeah. Because like, or Ruth has, Ruth has one like this, but it glares and it makes a lot of noise. But when it's in that tent, it cuts down on the noise because the, when the water runs and it doesn't have that glaring light. Well, and the warmth. Yeah, and it has the warmth. Yeah. Okay, so this is that five gallon system, only this is much bigger than a five gallon. Okay. <laughs> but you literally are just lifting it up but you can see how big those plant roots are getting on that tomato. And in a five gallon bucket system, and you have a flyer on the five gallon bucket system, um, you can make them yourselves. They are easy with a regular Home Depot um, lid and a bucket. You're cutting a hole in the bucket to the size net cup you want, or you can just set one of these on there. You're using the clay pellets. And through the side, you're gonna have two holes that go down. You know if you were having, well they're aquarium bubblers is what a lot of people use. And they have the little stone and it has two hoses that come out. So you make those two holes, it sits down in your water and it just bubbles in. Um, for five dollars you can grow huge plants. Um, but they're just choices. But you can buy a whole system if you want to. But I'm cheap, and so I would make my own <laughs> because I'm not paying $30 or $40. But just totally up to you. But there are certain things that work really well in a five-gallon bucket system. You can have a regular-sized tomato, uh, any kind of pepper. You can grow eggplants. You can grow squash. Squashes that work real well are like crooknecks or... Um, Butternut squashes work real well in that. Acorn? You could use an acorn, yep. Use summer squash or? Um, you could use a summer squash, you know, because it would just fan out those leaves would. You know, you would just have to have enough space for it because of how big those leaves get. Um, beans, now if you grow tomatoes or beans, you can literally, in the lid of the, the system, on the five gallon bucket, you can drill some holes so that your tomato cage will just slide right down in there. So then it balances your tomato and it's not moving one side or the other. And you use that for beans also? Yeah, because beans, a lot. well, it would depend, if you were just having bush beans, it wouldn't matter, but if you were having um, a pole bean, you'd have to have something for it to climb on, okay? Um, I don't know if you guys, any of you guys know Cody Mills. He used to live here and now he lives in Montana, and when he lived here, he started hydroponics. And he did huge tomatoes. And now he lives in Montana, he has his own greenhouse. And his tomato systems, though they start in these little ones, he get, moves them over to here. 
And then if you look way up there, you can see his um, lettuce system, and that is all tubes that go like this, back and forth. And the water just runs through that and then starts again. But he sells them all over in his part of Montana now. So he's a success story of a business that can be hydroponics. He's selling the, uh, the tube arrangements? Nope, nope. He just sells the lettuce and the tomatoes oh, and he's selling the, produce. the produce off of it. And so he, um, he does heat his greenhouse, but most of the starts he starts inside the house and then moves them when it gets a little bit warmer. Because otherwise you're using a lot of energy and you have to base that on how much money you're going to make from your sales. What's the lid? Where do you get that part? The lid? Um, these are just usually, you, I mean you can buy them, but you can just take a lid that goes on the bucket and drill through there. You can get a circular um, and, it. and it just drills it. Yeah. To match whatever size matter. Right, right. Like my husband has this this set of whole sauce. Whole sauce. Yeah. And you just pick the size that you need. Whole now sauce. Yeah, call no, call no, Joe. No, Mary, no one <laughs> <laughs> now with my hydroponic system I do have some tools. Um, this is a pH meter. It'll tell me what the pH of the water is. And this is a nutrient meter, and it will tell you the nutrients. I'm wondering with the tap water, do you check the nutrients, uh, do the nutrients first and see if it's got like 400 and then add that to however many nutrients you want? Should I be honest with you? Yes. Okay. When I first got it, I did all that stuff. Okay. I checked. Every week I was checking. I was doing all this stuff. I'd adjust. And then I thought, well, that's kind of stupid. Um, <laughs> and it was wasting my time. So um, I do it all based on how much water I put in there. It tells me if you're putting a gallon in, how much I put in. That's all I do. Perfect. If I would start to have problems, then I would start using my meter and going, what is happening? But I just figured that plants are strong and I don't want them to be weaklings anyway. I want them to have to strive a little bit anyway. Um, though hydroponics is pretty easy for a plant. And if, as long as I don't have problems, um, I'm just mixing it like that. I rarely use these anymore. Okay. But when I first got it, every week I was like, oh no, my plants aren't gonna work. But they did. <laughs> so, and like you can do a pH strip and you just dip it in the water and you can tell what basically what your pH is. You get a combo meter online. Oh, do you? Or you can get both meters coming for the same that? price. Yeah, and it's, oh, awesome. I bought and it's like 30 bucks for both of them. And do you use it all the time? I did it first. Ah, see? <laughs> see, that's what we do. We do it first. But I used, uh, <laughs> I was using the DI water. Oh. So tap water I would really like to use because it's a pain to get the osmosis water, you know. Right. Lot so. Right. And there, um, a few years ago on the Garden Walk, we were at Mr. Ingle's house. And he has this whole system that even his plants outside, he wants a certain pH, and which is really cool for him. I mean, he's a college professor. He likes that kind of stuff. But it was like... Uh, if I can't just pour water on there, I'm just not doing it, you know, because seriously, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of time, but it just depends on what you want to do. It's not right or wrong, it's just choices. And these are just some different systems. Um, this is more like a float system, and there's lots of herbs on there. This, you can see the little clay balls and the peppers coming out of it. Um, this is pictures from my system. And so you can see some are very small, they start to grow. That's the basil when it very first starts. Um, and that's the tomato when it's got the collar around it. Do those clay balls have like mold on them? Is that common to get? Um, you might get algae on them. Algae? Yeah. But, um, if it was getting mold, I would think that it's probably not enough movement. 
um, something's some bacteria is causing that mold. That's hard water on those ones. It's just like calcium. Yeah. Oh, do you have white? Oh, oh, you mean on this? Yeah, that's just calcium. Yeah, that's nothing. Um, now, say you don't want to go into the whole great big expense. Like my my system net right now, I didn't pay this much, but right now they sell for close to a thousand dollars. So you have to kind of think of it as an investment. Now, it will run for years and years and years. So for me, I was okay with that. I wanted something that in the wintertime, I would have fresh vegetables, but now I go to Arizona and I grow my own <laughs> in the wintertime. So it doesn't matter. But um, I still run it all summer long. You know, it's a great way to get my greens, my basil, and because sometimes basil can be really good and sometimes basil is really hard to grow in our summers. And so certain vegetables I want to grow in my hydroponics. It just makes it easy for me. But if you don't want to go through all that expense, there are things you can do. Now this is called an arrow garden. It's basically the same idea. You put nutrients in the water. This one has grows herbs, but they have them that you're growing tomatoes or lettuce. Um, most arrow gardens run around $100, $150, depending on what you get, what size you get, how many little cells that are in there. But the first arrow garden I ever got was, gosh, I bet you 15 years ago. And I did like it. You know, I have one down in Arizona. Um, they have full spectrum lights in here. They used to have tube lighting when they first came out, but now it's full spectrum. And so they have um, for both greens and for flowering. And so that is a feature I like. But the reservoir is down here. It has little cells that go down. They're just like net cups. They're just skinnier. But if you don't um, want to spend that, the money, you can buy one of these. It can sit on your kitchen counter or on an end table. And you get a lot of um, fruits, or, fruits or herbs in there. So it's kind of a fun little thing to do. Yeah, this was 104. I bought it today. I'm going to bring it back tomorrow. <laughs> I didn't open it up. And I thought, and I, I have one in my closet, but it was back in the back, and I thought, I'm not dragging that out. I'm just going to go buy one and take it back the next day. <laughs> you know, there's no harm. There's no marks on that box. <laughs> but this is my one down in Arizona. Things you have to remember. If you're going to use your own seed versus the seed that comes in there, the lettuce, it doesn't matter. But if you put a full-size tomato instead of a dwarf or a micro tomato in here, pretty soon it's way over the light and the roots have overtaken the whole reservoir. And so you just have to have a small-size tomato. But they grow extremely fast. I think this is probably two and a half, three weeks. And so it's already to where you can harvest lettuce. And when I'm harvesting the lettuce, I take the outside leaves and then it just keeps making more lettuce. This is another system. It has the lights, it has reservoirs, but look how much vegetables you can plant in just those little shelves. So you can just really have a like a little mini food forest right in your room. How many people would that? This one back here? Yeah. Well, it would easily feed a, a family of four, or four or six, really, because you would just keep um, clipping those leaves off. I just usually just twist the leaves, and it would just keep growing, just like when you do your lettuce on your garden. Yeah, you, you would say three or four meals a week. Oh yeah, easily. Yeah. Yeah, and I love in the wintertime, we got snow and blowing winds, and you can look at your hydroponics and it's just like, oh, spring will be here sometime. <laughs> you know, and all the time I'm breaking off stuff and just eating them, even when it's not um, 
our time to, you know, our dinners. You snack on them. <laughs> I do snack on them. Okay, questions about hydroponics? Oh, good. That's perfect. <laughs> okay, so let's grow some vegetables in Wyoming in the wintertime. Who does that? Anybody have anything on their window seals? I like to dig some stuff up out of the garden and make sure it's bug free before I bring it in and try to get another few months out of it. Right. Now there's a lot of herbs that you can do that so easily. You're growing rosemary, you're growing basil. Some people grow them in buckets, in containers outside so they can move them inside. You do have to be careful that you don't have any bugs that you're bringing in. And Mandy's got some bugs. <laughs> but can we grow fresh vegetables? Can it be like your garden? Is it possible to do that? Now here are some things that you can grow in Wyoming inside. Okay? Lettuce, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, squash, beans, peas, potatoes, onions, and all kinds of herbs. This is a system, you just have to have the right lights. Now, you don't have to have expensive lights. I have full spectrum lights and I have shop, shop lights that I use. When I'm using my shop lights, I have a warm tube and a cool tube because one helps with the, the leaves, one helps with the flowers. And as my plants grow, I just move that light up higher. Now, you can, even without a system, if you had a south-facing bay window, you could grow all kinds of stuff. Even the west, if it faces basically perfectly west, there's enough sunlight from the afternoon to when it sits that you can grow lettuces and certain things like that, okay? Now, one thing you have to remember, you cannot water your plants with soft water. I was talking to a lady this weekend when I was in North Dakota, and she's family by marriage. And they used to live in um, Washington. They just moved to Nevada. She brought all of her plants with her. And she said, after a couple weeks, they didn't look very good. And she thought, well, it was a, it was a long trip. They, had, you know, they were enclosed, you know. And pretty soon, one after another, died, died, died. And then she goes, then it hit me. I'm watering them with salt water. Because soft water is salt. And so once it got that salt buildup, there was no recovering. Those plants were dying. And she said, it was a good thing to learn. So they installed um, some kind of reverse osmosis. It doesn't have the, salt, the soft water in that part. And now she can have plants again. So you just have to remember, before you turn that tap on, is it just tap or is it soft water? Um, and some people will use a slow, slow release fertilizer. They're little pellets usually. You just sprinkle them on the top. Um, you, when I make my potting mix, I like potting soil. I like compost. I like worm castings, vermiculite, perlite. I like that whole mixture. Um, it lets the roots go through easy. Um, the soil looks good, <laughs> and I don't. I used to use peat moss, but peat moss is not a renewable renewable resource. And though it works good, I just don't buy that anymore. That's just a choice I make. Um, but lots of people use um, peat when they mix it mix it in. I have a bale of it. I have. Use it. I've had it for <laughs> yeah, you can just mix it with the potting soil and your compost and stuff like that. Yeah, it's just it's just something that I choose not to use just because it's not renewable. Um, microgreens. Has anybody ever grown microgreens? Yay! <laughs> now there are a lot of kinds of microgreens, and you can grow them in anything imaginable. Now, I like to grow microgreens and these little towers because I think they're fun. <laughs> and um, they just, see, they just, they're just towers. I got them at the dollar store in Arizona. And 
So I just stack them up, I put my soil in there, I sprinkle usually different kinds of microgreens, and then when they start to grow, I, um, I just clip them off. When it's all done, I just dump out the stuff and start again. They won't come back, huh? No, um, a microgreen grows very fast, and you, you wanna harvest it when it's only anywhere from two inches to four inches tall, when it has that strong amount of nutrients. Um, they probably have 40% more nutrients than a full grown plant. Especially broccoli. Broccoli, yes. Um, so we're gonna give this one away. Okay. And this one has um, Asian blend. I got these little packets at Rain Gardens. Uh, do you just put them near the kitchen window or something like that? Or do you um, put them under grow light? Or? Well, I have a lot of grow light stuff. So um, next to my hydroponics, I have this big crock with a piece of wood on there, and so they'll just sit there. Um, I'll show you a picture if they don't have any light, what they'll do. I have that farther on. So the last, the last three digits are 385. 385. Oh, okay. Okay, so I have another one. Now these ones are a little bit bigger. So you can put more microgreens in them. It's the same kind of system, they're just bigger. Okay. Mandy, give me another winner. Three eight seven. Yeah. 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 Yay! Yay! And these ones are purple kohlrabi. These are really good. Kohlrabi. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Now, after you do microgreens for a while, you will get a favorite. I didn't it, realize you were doing the, uh, the, the raffle here. I, 377 is my number. <laughs> 385, I think, was the first one. Now, you can buy the whole system of microgreens. These, this, they sell towards kids to get them interested in greens. And so it comes with the jar, it comes with all the substrates, it comes with the, um, the microgreen inside there. So it's something you can buy, you can put it as a um, stocking stuffer. Um, they sell these Home Depot, Menards. I got this one at Menards. I'm bringing it back tomorrow too. <laughs> Grow. I'm sorry? Do you put these in the window or do you put them under the lamp? Um, if, if I was you, I'd put them in a window unless you have lights. I have my hydroponic system on the wall, and then next to it I have this great big giant crock that has a piece of wood on it. And so the light from the hydroponics bounces on there, and so I just set it there. Oh. Okay? Um, you can grow microgreens without lights, but I'm going to show you a picture on what it does. Okay? So I've used these in all kinds of microgreens in all kinds of little containers. Um, muffin tins, um, little Tupperware that I didn't use anymore. I would put the, and you don't actually have to have soil even. You can have any kind of, like I have this roll of hemp stuff that you can line baskets with um, when I plant flowers. And I just cut it, it holds the moisture Microgreens have all the nutrients they need to grow before you cut them. And so, yeah, I mean, you can put some nutrient water in there to help them, but you don't actually have to have soil even. And so sometimes with a, a Tupperware container, I just cut that hemp stuff, put the seeds on top, put um, cardboard over it so they start to germinate. And when it, so as soon as they germinate, I take that off and let them grow. Wow. So, it's, they're easy to do and they're so good for you. Um, the reason why I like microgreens versus sprouting is because sometimes with sprouting, you know, you're rinsing the water and not like that. Um, in Europe, oh my gosh, it must have been 10, 15 years ago, um, 
all of a sudden there must have been fungus or something on the seeds and all kinds of people got sick from sprouts. And after I read that, I never did sprouts again. <laughs> it's actually into the sprout now and you can't get it out. Really? Yeah, so you just have to be careful. But microgreens, it never happens, you know, because it's not soaking in that water like, like it does. Um, so I just usually pick whatever microgreen I want to grow. Sunflower seeds are my favorite. Um, and then I just grow them. Once they get a couple inches tall, I'm cutting them, putting them in on salads, putting, putting them, um, oh, in sandwiches. Sometimes I just throw them on the, a little lettuce, you know, right on the plate. I like what it looks like. I look, and sometimes I just cut it and eat them. But, that's without sunlight there. Um, no, this is in a window, but I'm going to show you the next one. Um, this is those little towers that I gave away, and those just have succulents in. You can plant all kinds of stuff in those little towers. So on the microgreens, when we cut them, the more of them grow or no. they're done? No, they're done. Okay. Yeah, so you just cut them um, right at the, the level of the soil. And um, so a lot of times, like when who, you got the bigger ones, right the bigger containers I don't cut the whole thing I'll cut just a section of each one and then the next day or the day after I cut another section so it's not like I'm all of a sudden don't have there's a hole there and it doesn't have any plants you don't you don't let them go you know you keep them down in that two to four inch <gasps> right because that you want those nutrients that's the whole idea of them now, do you spray them with spray bottle? I miss them sometimes. If it's really hot coming through the window um, or um, next to the lights, I'll, I'll miss them. Yeah. yeah. Do you have special seeds or can you just use a regular packet of lettuce seeds? Or well, you can. I, I've used both. You know, like when, if you do a lot of microgreens, instead of just a little seed packet, you can order a whole bag. Like this is radish seeds. And so I just sprinkle what I want. And you can get all kinds of stuff. This is one of my favorite ones, um, Chinese cabbage. They sell this as a sprout, but they're just the regular seeds. They're not actually sprout ones. And like this is broccoli. You can just, whatever kind of things you like to eat, that's what you should plant. Um, I did grow some microgreens in my hydroponics this year. I don't usually do that. Um, and I did a spicy mix um, and baby greens. And so instead of that one hole, I poked a whole bunch of holes with toothpicks and then planted them. I just wanted to see how it would work. And then you have to cut it off. And it works pretty good? It works really fast. <laughs> And where do you get the seeds from? Um, those seeds all came from rain gardens. Yeah. Okay, now something else you can grow in your house is mushrooms. A few years ago, we had a class, and we actually brought a mushroom expert in. And we grew um, mushrooms in toilet paper rolls. So in your printout, it shows you how to grow mushrooms in a toilet paper roll. And it works so good, and it's so fast. But what you need is um, a roll of toilet paper, and you're dipping that into boiling hot water. You pull it out. You take that inside um, cardboard out. And then you're putting the mushroom spores in there. So this is the mushroom spores. They call it spawn, but it's spores, really. And you can see my toilet paper roll right there. You can actually do it in books. You know, you don't want to have ink that's not vegetable ink. But you soak the book and you can put it in between and then the book will open up like this when the mushrooms come out. And then you can see the mushrooms growing and this is my toilet paper roll. It literally gets covered with mycelium and then the mushrooms start to come out. Then when we left for Arizona last year, um, I took it out and I put it um, underneath. I have this little tiered thing that I have plants on. And I just set that toilet paper roll under there. This spring I had mushrooms again. And I would have never thought that it would have survived. But I think it was next to the house and it was sheltered and there was no wind and it didn't get a lot of snow. And so I had oyster mushrooms in my yard. 
So that was kind of fun. Certain kind of mushrooms grow on the wood or the oyster? Um, usually they use oyster mushrooms. Oyster. Yeah. And um, this was the handout we got when we had the class. And you can also buy a box to grow mushrooms. So you don't even have to use toilet paper. And so I'll pass this around. This is a, a mushroom kit. And the mushrooms are going to come out of here. That's where they're coming out right there. And it's, it's a fun little project. Can you get spawn out of that? It has it all in there. Everything well, you need is yeah, in there. After your mushrooms grow and everything? Yes, what you can do is, you know, most of the time people will take that and it grows the mushrooms, they cut them all off, and then they think it's done. But there's still plenty of them in there. You can break them up, plenty you can... Spawn. Yes. <laughs> and you can put them in other mediums? Like, yes. Like putting another toilet paper roll, for yes. example? Yeah, because not everything grows at that one time. Yeah. You know, you and can... We, I used to hunt mushrooms out in the fields out in California. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it would rain and we'd go out there and get a bunch of mushrooms and then uh, it'd be dry for a little bit. Then it'd rain again and we'd go out there and there'd a whole bunch more mushrooms. Right, because the mycelium works all over and then the rain will just make it go, all, you know, it'll rain and the next day you go out and there's mushrooms everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that's different between this and what you have on your booklet, because I have an expanded version, um, is that they use um, um, these special bags that have these little filters. So it looks like a little patch. But you don't have to use those. You can just use um, a Ziploc bag. You just want to keep it partway open, mist it in there every so often. But as long as you put that the mushroom in after the toilet paper roll has started to cool, you can just close it almost all the way up and pretty soon the whole toilet paper roll will get covered and then all of a sudden you have mushrooms. Good. It's really pretty cool. What's this bag that you, you're putting in? Well, I, I just use a, a Ziploc bag, but oh. they have a filter bag yeah. that's got a little patch in there and it lets the air go in and out. Did you just <laughs> leave yours open a little bit? The Ziploc bag, yeah. yeah. Um, you use a, like a gallon freezer bag? Right, yeah. right. Now, if you buy the mushroom online, I like to go to, it's called fieldforest.net, and that's where I get the mushroom spawn from. Fieldforest? Fieldforest.net. Um, when you order a bag, it's a lot of stuff, you know? And so what are you going to do with it all? You can share it with your friends, <laughs> everybody can have toilet paper, mushrooms growing all over the place. but. You can also, even after you put it in the mushroom, or in the toilet paper, you can close the Ziploc bag, put it in an extra refrigerator, and then when you're ready to use it, you pull it out, and it will do its whole thing. So it's already there for you. Fieldforest.com? No, .net. Forest or course? Forest. Forest. Yeah. <laughs> now, one of the other things I like to grow in my house, in the winter, are potatoes. Now, you probably are digging up your potatoes in your garden, you know, starting to eat them. Now, I like to chit my potatoes. Does anybody know what that means? Chit. Chit your potatoes. You know, if you had potatoes in your Lazy Susan and you forgot about them, and all of a sudden you open your Lazy Susan and you got all these eyes growing all over the place. <laughs> That's because it's dark and it's looking for light. But if you take them and put them not in direct sunlight, but in light, the eyes stay really short. They get really fat, they turn greenish purple, and that is chitting. And then I just take a great big bucket, I put my soil in there, um, potting soil compost, vermiculite, perlite. I do like to add worm castings too. And so that's about an inch and a half to two inches. And then I just set my potatoes on there. Then I fill it up to about an inch, inch and a half from the, the, the lip so I can water. And they don't need any light at all until they break through the soil. So I just usually set them downstairs and 
just let them grow. And when they start to do that, then I have to take them out to put them in some light. But Sandy, do you cut your potatoes? No, never. I used to cut my potatoes years ago because that's what everybody said. And then I thought, logically, you're planting this little potato. If you cut that in half, it doesn't hardly have any energy. And if you don't let it harden off, then it can spoil in the, the soil. So I just stopped doing it. And so I just lay them in there. And this, these are my potatoes growing under some lights. Mm. And they will go through their whole cycle in the wintertime for you. Oh. And, and then you have potatoes in the spring. So you're saying you'll put them two, two inches off the bottom of the... Yes. And how much soil can you cover? I cover them... Well, if I had a really tall bucket, I would cover them about six inches. But if I have like a two-gallon bucket, I'd fill it all the way to an inch and a half, two inches from the, the lip. So, so you can water. I do that. I do that in the summertime outside in, in, in tubs. Uh-huh. So I was wondering how much... I've been, what I've been doing is just planting them and putting about six inches of soil over them and then when they come up... Add more soil? Yeah. Yeah, you can do that inside too. Yeah, because, but until it breaks that soil, it doesn't need any light at all. So then when it breaks the soil, then you have to have it under lights or in a, a, a window. So usually when you do it, you stick it down towards the bottom and fill the bucket all the way up, except for this much yeah. of water. Yeah. And when it breaks, you get it in like... Yeah. Okay. You don't layer any potatoes. No. Okay. No. I suppose I could layer potatoes, but I don't. Okay? Um, this is microgreens if you don't have any light. Look at how leggy they are. And not that you can't use them, but I don't think they have as much nutrients, and I don't think they have, um, I don't think they taste as good. I don't think they're as strong, you know, because all of their energy is going to look for light. And so if this would have had lights underneath of it, it could have easily kept it short and I think they would have been better. But I thought I'd just show you that picture. Um, in the winter time, I like to grow rhubarb because it takes a long time to grow. And so, um, like right now at my house, I don't know if you saw them when you, there were some white little containers and they had little tiny leaves. Those are rhubarb. And I'm gonna actually take them to Arizona because you can't grow rhubarb in Arizona, except for the university um, has been doing it as a one season crop, as an annual. So they start it in the summertime, then they plant it out when it's got some true leaves on there, they let it grow through the, till springtime, they cut it, and then they have to start again. But at least you have some rhubarb. Mm -hmm. And so I'm taking it to Arizona. Can you grow it here and freeze it to get warm? <laughs> well, I could, but I only have X amount of space in my truck. <laughs> And so I had to prioritize. But I can fit those little um, containers in my, the doors of my back seat. <laughs> and so they work. And this is some of my onions. I like to grow onions. Um, this is before they're transplanted into bigger containers and they get a haircut. But you can grow onions, you can grow chives, anything like that in a sunny window under lights in the wintertime. So, your microgreens, what did you put in that container? Well, those aren't mine. It's just a photo. Oh, okay. okay? Um, but these are just flats, but I would guess they either have soil or some kind of mat. So I'm not sure. What soil would you use to keep? It's just so hard when I've done my microgreens, I always get soil in it. It's hard to get that soil out. Well, you know, after you've cut them and you got all those little things, if you have a bucket of water, you can literally hold onto the top and put them in the water and go like this, right. and most of the soil will go out, and then you can strain it. I just, I just still or, or just throw it away. Mm -hmm. Throw it in your compost. <laughs> I, I like to be an easy gardener. You know, if it's too hard, uh, I'm going to think of some way, other way to do it. Do you use a special soil? Uh, how do you keep from having gnats? Mandy has gnats. <laughs> well, I I use that. Jody, what are those little black things called? Well, they're they're the mosquito dunks. 
the, the, the fungus gnats are in the same order as mosquito and mosquito larva. And so at the weeding pest or whatever it's called mm -hmm. now, you can get those little ducks. Yeah, like they're about this big. Collecting rainwater. And they're like black, that high? Just little black, look like uh, little candies practically. But yeah. Um, you just put them in your rainwater or if you have, in your, if you have rainwater saved inside or a bucket of water that you're that you have inside that can sit in there. And all it does is it kills the larva stage of your fungus gnat and your mosquitoes. It's not gonna harm any other insect. It's just specific for that order. Yeah, and then some people will put um, sand or vermiculite or something on top of that soil so there's always a dry part because they wanna um, lay in the moisture of the soil. And so the drier you can keep that top level, so if you water from underneath, that will help it too. But those little black things, they're, they just, they do kind of look like a candy. Like, I think make like a tea with those too. I have mosquito dumps, but they're, it's yeah. not dumps, they're like, it's like a, yeah, it's like a box of pellets that you get and uh -huh. put them in like a tea bag. And you yeah. Tea with it. Yeah, because I just put, I just put one in my big spray bottle yeah. and it slowly dissolves itself, so I just spray. You know, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, because you can even cut those little yellow sticky traps into smaller pieces and just have them in your plants, and it will catch a lot of gnats. Cute, yeah, yeah, but. I have found so often that anymore the potting soil that you're buying in the store, they ha they have gnats in them. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh, on top. I I could see that. Yeah, yeah, because anything that becomes that barrier that the they can't the larvae can't get up, you know, and they can't come down to lay, I think would be good. Hmm. Yeah, diatomaceous earth. Yeah. Okay, so when you're planting inside, say you have a container, because you can use all kinds of containers. Even if it doesn't have drain holes, just make sure you have rocks or something that the extra water can go down into. But don't plant a giant tomato in a pot that's this size. So you have to have a small tomato plant so that you can, like this has vegetables and herbs, so it has rosemary in there. But if I had a full-size tomato, pretty soon that would take over that whole container. So you just have to kind of pre-plan the containers you're using and what you're going to put in it. Because you don't want one plant overtaking the rest of it. So let's grow some citrus. Now, before we went, used to, before we went to Arizona every year, I had oranges and lemons and grapefruits at my house. And every spring, my husband would have to use the dolly and take them outside. And every fall, my husband had to bring them back in. <laughs> but I love them, you know? Even, you know, sometimes when you're, you're in the north and it doesn't have the light and the, the temperatures, um, a citrus can lose its leaves, but it's not dead. It will make new leaves later on in the year. But nothing makes you smile more than a cold day and you have some lemons on a tree. So I brought some lemons. So before you leave, you can take a lemon tree. Um, I, these are from seeds from my lemon trees down in Arizona. And they do need to be repotted. The bag of soil I bought, I did not like. I thought it was too heavy. Um, but they grew anyway. And so I want you to just take them. Now, they're either a Meyer lemon or a Ponderosa lemon or a cross between the two because the, the trees are pretty close together, so it could be a cross. Um, a ponderosa lemon can make a lemon about three pounds. A Meyer lemon is just a regular size lemon. So eventually when it it grows up, you can have lemons. So I just thought I would do it. looking at that picture, the pot that that's in, does yes. that, doesn't it need a bigger pot? Because that would be crazy, I'd need a bigger pot. <laughs> well, it's just a matter of pruning. You know, they've pruned it so it's just going to be a bonsai. Um, well, bigger than a regular bonsai, but a, that kind of idea. Um, it's like if you came to my house, mm -hmm. I have a lot of apple trees, but there are probably three-fourths of them that are never going to get more than four feet tall because I don't want them more than four feet tall. So I prune them based on the shape and the size I want them. 
So you can do that with the citrus. You prune the roots also? At my house? Yeah. No, because they're in the ground. But if you were doing it in a pot, yeah. every so often you could pull it all out, prune the roots, just like if you were doing a bonsai, um, new soil, and put it back in there. You wouldn't even actually have to get it a bigger pot. It would just depend on the size of the fruit, fruit tree you wanted. So do you need, are they self-fertile or do they need? Most citrus, most citrus are theoretically um, self-fertile so that you don't have to cross-pollinate them. You can take a Q-tip and rub the different flowers on that tree and you will get more fruit. But you don't need two different trees? No. I mean, it, it's always helpful. It's just like apple trees in your yard. Um, if it tells you it's self-fertile, it can be, but you will get way more fruit if there's another tree. Can you, you said use a toothpick? A Q-tip. Q-tip? Yeah. Blue. Yeah. Uh, you can't use a like electric tooth, toothbrush to vibrate them like you do with peppers or. No, you could use um. You can you you can use a paintbrush. It, it's not a matter of vibrating like a, a tomato is. Yeah. It has to go from one flower to the other flower. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, in the winter time, you, it is fun to just grow other plants, regular house plants. They can make you happy too. So, <laughs> so I have um, some elephant ears here and some herbs that are about to go. That were at the time we were about to go into pots that I grew from seed, because I love elephant ears. They just get these humongous leaves, and they're fabulous in Wyoming. Um, if you have a greenhouse, you have the option to have some of your plants out there. If you, unless you have some kind of solar system or good heating system, it will, you can only keep them out there for a certain amount of time and then it gets too cold. Um, but there are people that have um, heaters or they have um, solar so that runs a heater so they're not paying electricity so that they can keep it at a certain temperature. In a greenhouse when you're growing it, if you choose vegetables that are a little more cold hardy, they're easier to grow out there. Like a tomato is not very easy to grow in the middle of winter, but there are a lot of lettuces and brassicas that you can grow that grow real slow until it starts to heat up more. So that's just an option. Um, this is one of my um, shelves downstairs for when I'm growing. Certain things when they get bigger they have to go into pots. Other things like that garlic up there, um, I'll just move, I just move the lights up. They'll just grow right in that, that tray. Um, this is this is my hydroponic system when I was switching out, um, but you know you can grow celery, you can grow peppers, right inside. This is another option for you. I just I'm just throwing this in. It's not growing inside, but this is called milk jug gardening. If you're going to do it, you're going to start probably next month. You're going to collect milk jugs water jugs, anything like that. You cut them almost all the way through, open them up, you put your soil in there, you put your seeds in there, you close them up, put them on the ground, and you cover them with snow. And in the springtime, you will have vegetables that come up. And then you can transplant them to your garden. But there's lots of YouTube videos on that. Um, some people call them winter sowing, some people call it milk jug gardening. So I just thought I'd throw that in there for you. The Master Gardeners are having a pumpkin class. This is one I made last year. Um, this pumpkin, I did it in October, or the first part of November, one of the two. Um, it stayed until March before the, t the pumpkin started to get soft. And, but Mandy took all the succulents that she had on hers, peeled the glue off, because you just cut the succulents and use hot glue to hook them on the top. And she planted them and they grew. I didn't even take them off. Mine are still hot glued all and they're just in a pot now and they're growing. They're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're interested in that, Mandy has a sign-up sheet. Um, it is a $30 charge. We have two different classes and because it was so popular last year. Um, and this is just some of my plants that I'm rooting and, and planting at windowsills. Questions? 
I'm sorry? Are those coffee cups? Oh, these? <coughs> they, they're sodas. Soda cups. Yeah, soda cups. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't actually have to have this lip around there. I just cut that. Um, you know, that's just options. You don't have to have it like that. You, could, you don't need a lid on there. But I don't know why I decided to do it that day. Keeps it warmer. Maybe. <laughs> Just inside your house, just or do you have a special root environment? No, they're just it, they're just in my house. Yeah. And it works. What temperature do do you usually have your house in, in the winter time? Uh, sixty-eight-ish. That's 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 borderline on some vegetables. Too dry though. Well, um, to fix the dryness, a lot of times if you just mist once a week or a couple times a week, mm -hmm. that can really help the plants. You know, because we are dry, you know, we don't have humidity, yeah, yeah. you know. When my husband says, oh man, it's humid out, it's like, what planet are you living on? <laughs> you know, because seriously, we don't really have humidity. Um, if you go to the eastern side of South Dakota, they have humidity. In Florida, I'm they... i here from Nevada, so it was humid here. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's all relative on what you're used to, yes. <laughs> uh, mine was humid last night. Yeah. Oh, when it was raining? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. was also humid this morning and foggy. <coughs> oh, we didn't have any fog. Interesting. So you have forced air heat in your house in the winter. It, 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 will, dry, really. it will dry, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have a wood stove downstairs and then fans that circulate around. But I have a, a mister that I spray stuff on, you know. It just helps it, you know. They can absorb through the leaves, not just through the roots. So it helps them. Were you giving out the chocolate mint at the herb festival? Yes. Okay, because I tried to get that to root. Uh huh. And no. <laughs> oh, if you want some more, I have plenty of it. Great. <laughs> I'll, I'll try again. Yeah. Great. Yeah. She's, she's leaving. You can buy. She's leaving. Yeah. 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 I'm only here another month, so if you want it, you call the extension <laughs> office. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. Um, next month, of course, the pumpkin. Then we don't have one again till In December, we have a wreath making. Class. Oh, yeah, wreath making. But we're not sure on the date yet. Okay, and um, make sure on, you take. We are on YouTube and we are on Facebook. Our yep. YouTube channel is Campbell County Master Gardeners. And then on Facebook, it's the same thing, Campbell County Master Gardeners. And make sure you take a lemon. But you need to repot it.